In the early 1970s, a friend introduced me to Hal Lindsey's late great planet Earth and things I had never heard before. Scary end times things allegedly about to unfold between 1981 and 1988. However, if I embraced Jesus, I could escape all of it by means of the rapture. Uh Uh-huh. Well, I did embrace Jesus, but here's a crucial point. Jesus should be embraced not because of what Lindsay was talking about, but because he is the promised Messiah who died for your sins, was raised, returned to heaven's throne, holds all authority, and all of us will stand before him in judgment someday. In previous videos, I noted that before I began seriously studying the Bible, I embraced Hal Lindsey's version of the popular end time scenario that divides Jesus' return into two separate events, a secret coming to rapture the saints, then a seven-year tribulation period during which Antichrist will lead the world into increasing evil, culminating in the Battle of Armageddon, and then Jesus will return again, visibly in glory this time, to begin ruling an earthly kingdom for a thousand years. However, as I continued reading scripture, I eventually came to the realization that I could not remember ever encountering the phraseology or even the idea of a seven-year tribulation period anywhere in the Bible. I embraced the idea because of Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great Planet Earth. Eventually, I realized there were enough discrepancies between what I found in the Bible and Lindsey's ideas that I would need to apply some serious study. You know, collect and analyze evidence and follow it wherever it leads, ask the tough questions, and so on. These videos reflect how my thinking changed as I did that. In this video, we will investigate the validity of the seven-year tribulation. In the last video, I presented evidence that the secret rapture is probably not a biblically sound idea. The living saints are never portrayed as the first ones taken out at the end of the age. And when they do meet Christ in the air, it is not a secret event. Jesus never suggested that he would return secretly and then again visibly seven years later. When describing what would happen, he merely spoke of the end of the age and the coming of the Son of Man as though it was a single event. He also did not associate it with a time of horrendous calamities in World War III, but said that unbelievers would be caught by surprise because they've been going about the normal affairs of life, even talking about peace and safety. A number of former dispensationalists have researched the dividing of the Second Coming into two separate events, a secret rapture and then a glorious appearance seven years later and found that this was not a belief of the church or historic premillennialism for at least 1,500 years. Instead, it appears to have originated with J.N. Darby in the early 1800s, although the idea was ardently rejected by other premillennial scholars, both within and outside of Darby's Plymouth Brethren Church. So if Jesus' second coming is a single event, and not two events separated by a seven-year tribulation period, then the next question was obvious. Is this seven-year tribulation period also an imaginary byproduct of the two-phase notion of Jesus' return, or something that can actually be found clearly taught in Scripture? Concerning the seven-year tribulation period, many simply pass on the assertion that the book of Revelation describes it. With fuzzy comments like this, which was copied from a church's online statement of beliefs. Immediately after this catching away of the saints, the tribulation period, spoken of in Revelation, will begin. Really? Where is that in Revelation? I really believe that the best way to understand what the Bible teaches is to actually consult the Bible, rather than trust what somebody else claims that it teaches. So where did the inspired writers actually use the terminology for tribulation, and what did they say about it? To investigate topics tied to specific terms and phrases, there are concordances for the Hebrew and Greek texts that identify these. And there are exhaustive concordances keyed to various English translations of the Bible. However, did the translators of your preferred version Use consistent word choices so that you can see in the English Bible where tribulation and great tribulation were discussed.
The most common Greek word translated tribulation is thlipsis, a word that literally means pressure and was used many times for tribulation, trouble, and affliction. Several English versions, King James, the New American Standard, and the English Standard versions, have been very helpful in translating the word thlipsis as tribulation in many instances, so it can be recognized as something larger than the alleged seven-year period of popular belief. And the phrase thlipsis megale, great tribulation or great affliction, does appear in a handful of places. Unfortunately, the end times beliefs of many working on the NIV led them to translate Thlipsis as tribulation only at Revelation 7.14, giving the impression that tribulation refers only to popular end times beliefs. In the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, Thlipsis was only used 11 times for the trouble that individuals and Israel would encounter in the ongoing realities of life. Only Daniel 12.1 would be cited by end times enthusiasts, but again only because some of the early promoters of the church age gap approach also inserted it between chapter 11 verses 35 and 36. Without the imagined gap, Daniel 12.1 could very well point to Jesus' first coming because nothing is said about a seven year period and the resurrection of many could be looking ahead to what is found in Matthew 27, 50 to 53. In the Greek New Testament, Thlipsis is used 45 times, again as a general word for the pressures and troubles of life, both through the apostles and other believers. When tribulation is mentioned with a definite article, the tribulation, we find it referring to the destruction of Herod's temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD, a woman in childbirth, and the persecution that arose with Stephen's death. The last reference to the tribulation comes in Revelation 1, verse 9. Writing in the late first century AD, John said that he and his readers were participating together in the tribulation, kingdom, and perseverance, which are associated with Jesus. Whatever the tribulation and the kingdom are, the Apostle John said they were realities that first century Christians were already participating in. So much for the tribulation being a seven-year period just before Jesus' visible second coming. Anyone interested in what the New Testament says about the tribulation must consider these passages. What you cannot find in any clear biblical reference is tribulation associated with a seven-year period just before Jesus returns. When it comes to great tribulation, Thlipsis Megale, we find that it was what was coming in the approaching fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. It was the troubles Israel experienced in the wilderness during the time of Moses. It was what the false prophetess in Thyatira and her followers would receive if they did not repent. And from the perspective of heaven's throne room, John saw martyrs coming out of great tribulation, a present participle, as he watched, Revelation 7:14. As in Revelation 1.9, it was clearly something already going on in the first century. Nowhere in Scripture is Great Tribulation associated with the second half of a seven-year period just before Jesus returns. And here are the other references to Thlipsis, or Tribulation, in the Greek New Testament. In John 16.33, Tribulation is something that Jesus told his followers that they would experience in this world, as well as the rest of us throughout this age. But we can take courage from the fact that Jesus had overcome the world. In Acts 14.22, Paul said that it is through many tribulations that believers enter the kingdom. In Romans 2.9, it is something that every person who does evil will experience. In Romans 5.3, it is something for Christians to exult or boast about because it contributes to growth and perseverance. In Romans 8, verse 35, tribulation cannot separate us from the love of God. In Romans 12, 12, tribulation is something that Christians must persevere through. In 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 6 and 7, the believers in first century Thessalonica 
had received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit and became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. And in Revelation 2.9, tribulation and poverty were two things the first century believers in Ephesus were experiencing. But someone might say, yeah, but the book of Revelation identifies the seven years in two three-and-a-half-year periods, 1260 days and 42 months. Well, actually it never mentions a seven-year period, but rather a three-and-a-half-year period five times. And none of these passages are associated with the word for tribulation. 1260 days is associated with God's two witnesses prophesying in Jerusalem and God's protection in the wilderness of the faithful woman who brought forth the Messiah. Time, times, and half a time is also applied to the woman protected in the wilderness. 42 months is how long Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles and how long the dragon-empowered beast is authorized to act. So you have three and a half year periods mentioned five times. But how do you get a clear-cut seven years from that? You could add up all five for a 17 and a half year tribulation period, or add four and have a 14 year tribulation period, or three for a 10 and a half year tribulation period. Or maybe all five refer to the same or different three and a half year periods. Revelation is a book of apocalyptic symbolism and never mentions a seven year tribulation period. So maybe we should be cautious on handling those numbers. The only time that the word for tribulation is associated with a time period in the book of Revelation is in chapter 2, verse 10, 10 days. But since nobody has yet imagined how to turn 10 days into seven years, this is never mentioned. Bottom line, nowhere in scripture was the Greek word for tribulation or the Greek phrase for great tribulation ever used in connection with a seven or three and a half year period just prior to Jesus' return. That connection came from the uninspired speculators who produced the currently popular scenario. When the Bible writers did speak of the tribulation, it was something already going on in their time. And great tribulation was tied to the time of Moses and events in the first century AD. If you want to believe in a future seven-year tribulation period just before Jesus returns, you'll have to continue reading the popular literature and listening to TV preachers, because you will not find it in the text of Scripture. God's larger plan was that humanity's serpent and sin problem would be dealt with by a wounded Messiah to come through a specified genealogy. When this lineage came to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God made specific promises to them. He would bless and protect them personally, which he did. Their descendants would become a nation in Canaan, which God tried to do during the Mosaic Age. And finally, through this lineage, specifically the tribe of Judah and the family of David, the Messiah would appear and provide blessings to be offered to all nations. The dream interpretations and prophecies in Daniel 2, 7, 8, and 11 are tied to four historical empires that would rule the Middle East and Israel between the time of Daniel and Jesus' first coming. Neo-Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece and the breakup of Alexander's empire into four sections, and finally the Messiah and Son of Man and his kingdom would appear in the days of the fourth, the Roman Empire. Daniel 9, 24 through 27 predicted a 490 year period within which God would finish his work focused on the Jews in Jerusalem, accomplishing a number of things in preparation for the predicted international messianic age. In verse 25, we are told that Messiah the Prince would appear 483 years after a decree was given to restore Jerusalem following the exile to Babylon. If this decree is that of Artaxerxes recorded in Ezra 7, 11 to 26, then 483 years from 457 BC brings us to 26 AD, when John presented Jesus to Israel through his baptism. Given that verse 27 begins with the pronoun he, verses 26 and 27 were intended as Hebrew parallelism, to be read side by side, 
so that you have an obvious noun to identify the pronoun. Accordingly, the Messiah would appear and be cut off. He would make a strong covenant with many and put an end to sacrifices in the midst of these seven years. Well, Jesus appeared on schedule. He died after a three and a half year ministry, and in his death he inaugurated the predicted new covenant and provided the final once for all sacrifice that would complete and finish the sacrificial system. With everything in verse 24 accomplished by the Messiah within the 490 years, the parallels continue into the second parts of verses 26 and 27 with God's judgment on the people and city that had resisted his will and purposes for 1400 years, and the desolation of Herod's temple as Jesus had already predicted. Jesus taught elsewhere that his rejection and death would be followed by judgment on rebellious Judaism. Daniel's prophecies, unless tinkered with, all point to the first coming of Jesus, and according to the promises to the patriarchs and what the prophets predicted, after the Messiah appeared, his blessings would be offered to the nations, which is what is now occurring through the Gospel and Great Commission. Reading Daniel 9, 24 through 27, focused on Jesus the Messiah, is in harmony with Jesus and the Apostles' view that first coming events fulfilled Jesus' mission. It was what God planned and intended. It was what all of the prophets were looking ahead to. And John was told that testimony concerning Jesus is the very breath or spirit of prophecy. If this reading is correct, then everything in this prophecy is tied to Jesus' first coming and was finished and fulfilled by the end of the first century. There is no time left over for an alleged future seven-year tribulation period. The men who crafted the currently popular scenario were committed to a different view of God's larger program, one in which the central concern and ultimate goal of God's larger purposes is held to be a national Israelite earthly kingdom with Jesus ruling from an earthly throne. How do you stretch prophecies tied to historical kingdoms between the time of Daniel and Jesus' first coming so they appear to point to Jesus' second coming? You make assertions. You assert that the messianic kingdom must be an earthly kingdom, and Jesus intended to establish it, but he was rejected, so it was postponed. You assert that the church was unknown to the Old Testament prophets and was put in place as plan B for Gentiles until Jesus returns to finish God's promises to Israel. And you assert that, to be understood, Daniel's prophecies require a church-age gap imagined between verses so as to shift the kingdom to the second coming. What are the ramifications of this scenario? According to this view, the 490 years of Daniel 9.24 is really 483 plus 2,000, give or take, plus 7, or 2,500 years. Jesus' first coming is viewed as a failure to accomplish God's intentions, which required a postponement and a shift to an unpredicted plan B. The Old Testament prophets were really looking to Jesus' second coming. Jesus' coming during the Fourth Kingdom is really referring to a future revived Rome, and associating Revelation 6 through 19 with a future seven-year tribulation means that everything described in those chapters must be viewed as still future. Are we really supposed to read Revelation 12, 1 through 10, and believe that Jesus will again be born, escape Satan's attempt to kill him in infancy, and be exalted to heaven's throne during this future seven-year period? Didn't all of that already happen in his first coming? Daniel 9.27 offered seven years that could be seemingly disconnected and moved to the future. So here is how these folks read that prophecy. Verses 24 and 25 are given little attention. In verse 26, Jesus' first coming is minimized as he appears and dies with nothing. No big deal. With verse 26b, correctly seen as the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Then the entire church age, at least 2,000 years, is imagined between verses 26 and 27. That's a gap four times the length of the predicted span of time. 
Allegedly, now, 2,000 years later, verse 27 begins with the pronoun he, which these folks confidently assert is their single end times antichrist figure, making a covenant with the Jews, allowing them to rebuild the temple and resume animal sacrifices. But after three and a half years, he will enter and desecrate the temple by proclaiming himself to be God, taken from 2 Thessalonians 2, ending the sacrifices. And then for the next three and a half years, the world will be plunged into increasing great tribulation until Europe, Russia, and China send huge armies to beat the tar out of each other for control of the Middle East in the Battle of Armageddon. So what's wrong with this scenario? I reject the alleged church age gap in Daniel's prophecies, first of all, because there is nothing in the text to suggest these gaps. They are concocted to make those prophecies appear to support the dispensational scenario's notions about the second coming. It robs Daniel's prophecies of their obvious intent of preparing the Jews for Jesus' first coming. It slices off the last seven years, violating the unity of the prediction, and slides it forward 2,000 years for an imagined future seven-year tribulation period that cannot be found clearly taught anywhere in Scripture. The assumed gap is deduced from an assumed earthly kingdom postponed, which has never been God's intention and ignores Jesus' comments about the kingdom being established in his first coming. It portrays Jesus' first coming as a failure, while he and his apostles saw it as a success, God's intention and what the prophets had predicted. And the Battle of Armageddon is not about worldly armies battling each other. Inserting huge gaps in Daniel's prophecies. While obviously foundational in supporting their seven-year tribulation notion, there are two things about the text of Daniel 9, 26 and 27 that make such a gap between verses highly unlikely. First, the essential overview of the prediction is in verse 24. God would complete his focused work with the Jews and Jerusalem accomplishing a number of specific things within a specified 490-year period of time. Verses 25 through 27 simply add details to how this 490-year period would unfold. However, inserting a huge gap, four times the length of the specified number of years, destroys the whole point of predicting a 490-year period of time. If God meant a 2,500-year period, he could have at least hinted at that. But remember, the people suggesting a huge secret gap between verses also tend to be those who are adamant about reading prophecy literally. God says what he means and means what he says, unless they want to imagine something different. Inserting a secret 2,000-year gap between verses 26 and 27 would be like me claiming that it is 490 miles from Miami, Florida to Calgary, Canada, and then explaining it this way. You drive 483 miles to Tifton, Georgia, disconnect the odometer, drive another 2,000 miles, then reconnect the odometer seven miles outside of Calgary and drive into town, 490 miles. You would say correctly that I am a knucklehead. But that's exactly how these folks handle Daniel 9, 26 and 27 to make it fit their scenario. Second, verse 27 begins with the pronoun he, and this is after an alleged 2,000 year gap, which from a literary perspective is absolutely ridiculous. Pronouns only make sense when they have already been identified with an obvious noun. You must first identify the character, and then you can use pronouns to refer to them. However, separated from its context, these folks can claim that the he is their future single antichrist figure. But the text tells us he will make a covenant with many and end sacrifices. But along with not identifying the he, it does not identify who he makes a covenant with, the nature of the covenant, or how sacrifices are stopped. So at this point, they plug in Paul's man of lawlessness from 2 Thessalonians 2, appearing in the temple. But we'll see in the next video that Paul was probably not thinking of a restored Jerusalem temple when he wrote that. If all you have is some guy making a covenant and stopping sacrifices, then how could anyone know that he is the alleged future Antichrist? 
Why not claim it's the Pope or Saddam Hussein or Vladimir Putin, whoever's running Iran, Obama, or I know one that would sell lots of books, Donald Trump. Sound like nonsense? Yes, the gap notion turns this passage into disconnected nonsense, focused on an unidentified pronoun that speculators can identify with any character they choose. Another key passage seriously mishandled is a portion of Jesus' Olivet Discourse in which Matthew 24 verses 3 through 34 are portrayed as referring to Jesus' second coming. You've probably heard verse 3 portrayed as the disciples asking Jesus about when and signs preceding the second coming. Then wars and rumors of wars in verses 6 and 7 are asserted to be the signs of the times just before Jesus returns and both Great Tribulation and Tribulation are mentioned. Little or no attention is ever given to the larger context and inconvenient points in the text. The best thing that you can do is put down the paperback book, stop listening to TV preachers, open your Bible, and read the whole Temple Olivet Discourse, Matthew 23 through 25 and compare it with the two condensed parallel versions in Mark 12, 41 through 1330, and Luke 21, 1 through 32. Matthew 23 to 25 gives us the entire discourse, first in the temple area, on the way to the Mount of Olives, and then on the Mount of Olives. Jesus addressed three basic topics the problems with first century Pharisaic Judaism, the approaching judgment upon Jerusalem and desolation of the Herodian temple complex in 70 AD, and then the end of heaven and earth, the coming of the Son of Man and final judgment. As for the approaching destruction of Jerusalem and desolation of Herod's temple, Jesus in the Herodian temple area had just said this generation, the one he was speaking to, would see the desolation of Jerusalem's house. And this is clearly the Herodian temple complex that the disciples would point to in just a few minutes. And Jesus would tell them plainly that it would be torn to the ground. Many promoting the popular scenario will ignore the context, start at verse 3 and claim the disciples were asking about the second coming and a rebuilt temple 2,000 years in the future. I'm not kidding. That's how these folks handle scripture to make it fit their scenario. Matthew's version of the question in 24.3, as is his whole gospel, was worded for a Jewish audience, reflecting the disciples' lack of understanding at that point of what was really coming because they still believed popular rabbinic expectations. And for a summary of these, please see Edersheim's summary in my second video, The 1000 Years. They did not yet understand Jesus' approaching death, resurrection, and the Great Commission. The parallels in Mark 13.4 and Luke 21.7 clarify for Gentile readers that what they ultimately and very reasonably wanted to know was, when would Jerusalem and the temple be destroyed and what signs would indicate that it was approaching? Well, Jesus identified when by twice noting that all of this would happen to this generation the generation he was addressing when he said these things, 30 to 70 AD. Jesus also identified specific signs that they could be looking for that would be leading up to it. However, these are not the signs of the times, for that phrase only appears in Matthew 16:3, where Jewish leaders were requesting more miraculous signs identifying Jesus as the Messiah for which he rebuked them for being able to predict the weather from observable conditions, but unable to recognize the signs of the times, the miracles already pointing to him as the Messiah. If the signs of the times referred to something 40 or 2,000 years in the future, there would have been no way they could have seen them and no reason for Jesus' rebuke. In Luke's parallel, the signs of the times is replaced with this present time when he was speaking to them. The signs of the times have nothing to do with either the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD or the second coming. The tribulation and great tribulation are mentioned in this section addressing the approaching judgment on Jerusalem and Herod's temple 
not in the later section about the end of heaven and earth and the coming of the Son of Man. It is not portrayed as worldwide, but as something to only occur in Judea, so that escaping it only requires leaving Judea, for which Jewish Sabbath travel restrictions might create a problem. This tribulation is worse than anything before or after, which indicates that it does not come at the end of history and would be cut short to limit its impact. Afterwards would come a period of time during which people will be falsely claiming to know the time and place of the Messiah's return, and they should be ignored because when it happens, it will be like lightning and all will know it. Finally, when Jesus began to discuss the end of heaven and earth, his return, and the final judgment, it should be obvious that he has just switched to a very different topic. He said twice that the events in the previous section would occur to that generation, and he identified signs to look for as it approached. But as for the end of heaven and earth, his coming, and final judgment, he explicitly said that he did not know when that would occur. His illustrations were specifically designed to show that there were no last-minute warning signs leading up to this, and that it would come as a surprise to everyone including his disciples. So get ready and stay ready. As I came to doubt the popular two-phase second coming and rapture, it logically led to questions about the seven-year tribulation period alleged to unfold between the two phases. As we've now seen, the seven-year tribulation notion is also popular mythology, which logically leads to questions about the star of that show, the alleged single Antichrist. Where did the Bible writers use the term Antichrist, and did they describe a dashing charismatic world leader to appear just before Jesus returns? Well, given what we've already seen, anybody want to guess how that will turn out? The next video, Antichrist. <laughs>